Hello everyone, thanks for joining with me on this 4th of July weekend. We are going to be having communion together and so I want to give you a moment or two to um, grab a, a glass or a cup of juice or water, whatever you have, and a piece of bread. Again, as we have communion and we partake of the bread and the drink, we are doing it in remembrance of Jesus and what he has accomplished for us. And while you're getting that, we are going to go to a couple of scriptures regarding that. One is in Hebrews chapter 4. The other is in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah in chapter 53. These two scriptures are important as we get ready to partake of communion because it tells of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ and that he is there to help us. So I would like to read from Hebrews chapter 4 first and we will be looking at verses 14 and 15. So Hebrews 4 starting at verse 14 says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet was without sin. That scripture tells us that Jesus understands the temptations that we face because he went through those temptations just as we do, yet he was without sin, which enables him to be that perfect sacrifice for our forgiveness. So in Isaiah chapter 53, starting at verse 1, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Now it tells us what Christ has done for us. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What the scripture tells us is that Jesus Christ was tempted in every way, he was without sin, and yet he took your sins and mine upon himself when he went to Calvary's cross. He paid the sin debt that he did not owe, but he took our sin debt upon himself, the Holy Son of God, and he died in our place, taking upon himself the wrath of God, so that as you and I come to him confessing our sins in the need of a Savior and ask him to forgive us of our sins and to be our Savior, the Bible tells us that God is faithful, that he will forgive us of our sins and purify us from everything that is unrighteous or not right in God's sight and we can be born again into a living hope in Jesus Christ that one day we will see God face to face, not in fear of judgment, 
but knowing that he has accepted us as his children because we've believed in his son, Jesus Christ, and we placed our faith in him for the forgiveness of our sins. When we take of communion and we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we are imitating what Jesus did with his disciples at his last supper. And when we do that, we remember what Jesus has done for us. When we partake of the bread, we're remembering that by the stripes that he bore, we are healed spiritually and physical healing is available to us through the cross as God would will us to be healed. When we drink of the cup of grape juice, it is a symbol of his blood that was shed at Calvary's cross for the forgiveness of your sins and mine. So as we do this as an act of faith, confessing our sins, asking God to forgive us, we are forgiven and purified. As we partake of the bread, we're remembering all that he's done so that we have the right to approach the Father, not only for spiritual needs, but physical needs as well. So if you've have the time and you've gotten a piece of bread or a cracker or something like that. Again, we do this by way of remembrance. So let's take a moment and pray before we eat of the bread. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of your son, that he did it for us, that the scourging and the stripes that he bore was to bring us peace with you and right relationship that by the stripes that he bore, we could be healed from our sin, that we can approach you when we have a physical need, asking you for healing, to heal us bodily, but more importantly, God, knowing that you heal us spiritually. So let us break this bread and eat together in Jesus' name. Now, if you'll take the cup, the symbol of the blood of Jesus, the Bible tells us without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. But it also tells us that the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. So when we drink of the cup, again, it's an act of faith. It, it's not necessarily the drink that we take to our lives, but that we remember that Jesus shed his blood for us. So by partaking of the grape juice as a symbol of his shed blood, we are confessing and remembering that it's only through faith in what Jesus accomplished for us that our sins can be forgiven and washed away. So let's drink of the cup together today. Jesus, we thank you for what you did for us, and we place our faith in what you did, that you took the wrath of God against the sin, our sins, but not only ours, but the sins of the world. And as each individual places that faith and that trust in you, confessing their sins, knowing that you will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness and that by faith we are in right relationship with you. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Today I want to uh, continue in our series that we started last week about the Father's love. So this is number two in the series. And... Uh, we will be going to uh, the book of Deuteronomy in just a few moments. Um, this weekend, 4th of July weekend, um, holiday for us. And it is a time when we remember uh, our independence from England. The Revolutionary War was fought to gain our independence from that nation, from the king of England and we became an independent nation at that time. And the founders of our nation uh, 
allowed us through those whole series of events to become a self-governing nation and we have the Declaration of Independence and we have the Bill of Rights and these are two pieces of literature that we should know and cherish because in them it declares what freedoms were established for us as a nation and without our knowledge of them our freedoms can be quickly swept away so i just want to encourage you to be familiar with those two documents the declaration of independence and and the bill of rights and those are great things for us as as american citizens and you may be asking well pastor how does that tie into a message about god and here's how it ties in because we are an independent nation and we have learned through over the last couple of centuries that we have independence, here's where the problem potentially comes in for us as believers. When that independent a spirit comes in and we want to be independent from God and his word, thinking as a free individual that we have rights and freedoms well we do on a governmental level but when we come to faith in jesus christ what we are doing is declaring our dependency upon him when you think of our salvation jesus told us that no one can come to him unless the father draws him so the fact that we have come to faith in christ god initiated that by drawing us to christ God the Holy Spirit has brought conviction into our hearts to know and understand that we have been living in rebellion against God in his word. So he has convicted us of our sins and made us aware that we need a savior. Jesus Christ, God's son, came and lived a sinless life for us and took the wrath of God upon himself that as we place our faith in him as our savior and our lord that we are saved god has enabled us number one to be forgiven through his son jesus he has enabled us to be purified from all unrighteousness through the blood that he shed and because of that we can be reconciled to god not only just reconciled, brought into right relationship, but the Bible tells us that God has adopted us as his children, as sons and daughters of God, which means we are now heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. The problem comes in when we have an attitude of independence toward God and his word. Jesus truly is the savior of all mankind. There is no other savior for us when we call upon him to be our savior, it also means that he becomes our Lord or one who has authority over us. Lordship means he has authority and power over our lives. He becomes our master, but a master who loves us, one who works all things together for our good because we love God and have been called according to his purpose. So when we understand what it means to be a Christian, yes, we are saved and Jesus is our savior, but he is also our Lord. Last week, we looked at a couple of scriptures and I just want to read them to you by way of remembering Proverbs 3 verse 11 and 12 says, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. And in Hebrews chapter 12 in verse seven, it says, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. So that was the springboard uh, for this series of sermons. God is concerned about our eternal destiny he's concerned about our heart he's concerned about our spirit that we are in right relationship with him 
He desires that we should spend eternity with him. And that's why Jesus came. He does not want us to be separated from him for all eternity. And he gives everyone an opportunity to be saved. Today might be your opportunity if you haven't yet received Christ as your Savior and Lord. The Bible tells us that, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we should be saved. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one goes to the Father except through him. But he leaves us that choice. He leaves us the choice to receive him as our Savior, to receive him as our Lord. And let me just say this. The title of Savior and Lord cannot be separated. They are joined together. So if Jesus is your Savior, he is also to be your Lord. And here's where the difficulty with our independent mindset can come in. For Jesus to be Lord, it means that we are willing to do his will. We are willing to do the will of the Father. His will has priority over our own will. So it means this, that we recognize and accept our dependency upon him for life and breath and everything else. God holds our life in his hands and he is working to bring us in right relationship with himself. And all that we go through is so that we will recognize of what is truly in our hearts. So often we, we always see ourselves as being right or being pure or somehow that we are just good people. Therefore, God has to bless us or, and, and those things are just not true. So when we recognize our dependency upon God for salvation, for right relationship with God, for just living right, that's when we come into the place of God's fullest blessings. I'd like for us now to go in the Old Testament into the book of Deuteronomy, the eighth chapter. Deuteronomy chapter eight, and we'll look at verses one through 10. Deuteronomy chapter eight, verses one through 10. Give you a moment to find that place in your Bibles. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. Now, this is a picture of Israel. And just a little background to this account that we're going to read. During a time of great famine, there was a man named Joseph who was sold into slavery by his brothers, went into Egypt, was there for a number of years, in God's direction and providence, he became second in all of Egypt. Pharaoh was only greater than he, but God had sent him there so that he would be the person that would be able to keep his family alive during the time of this famine. So his family was brought into Egypt. They lived in Egypt for 400 years. And during that time, the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh of Egypt, turned against the children of Israel and they became enslaved. So they cried out to God for deliverance. God delivered them out of Egypt, took them to a place of promise, which is referred to as the Holy Land. And they were to go in and spy out that land to see if it was like God told them. But at the end of those 40 days, they spied out the land. 10 of the 12 that went in gave an evil report that they weren't able to take the land, so they rebelled against God and his word, and they had to spend 40 years wandering 
in the desert because of their rebellion against God. And that kind of brings us a, a nutshell picture to this passage of scripture. So in Deuteronomy chapter eight, starting at verse one, the whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord, your God, has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on, on you, and your foot did not swell these 40 years. Know then that in your heart, that as man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks of water and fountains and springs flowing out in the valleys and the hills, a land of wheat and barley and of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper, and you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. In this passage in Deuteronomy, these verses, we see God's love and his faithfulness in his requirements so that we may receive and rejoice and enjoy in God's full blessings. You see how he has promised their forefathers, how he has brought them and led them and he did it to test them, to see what was in their hearts. It's not as though God needed to know what was in their hearts. God knew their hearts already. They needed to see and recognize what was in their hearts, whether or not they would keep the commands that God gave them. When they were going through that wilderness, there were times when they were hungry and didn't know what they were eating, yet God provided manna and food for them to eat. When they were ran out of water, they didn't know where they would get water, but God provided them water. Their clothes did not wear out in 40 years of journeying. Their feet did not swell or blister because of the rough terrain that they were going through. God took them through a series of testings and hard times and difficulties to test what was in their hearts to find out whether or not they would be willing to obey the command of God. Then he says, if you are willing to do this, I will take you into the land that I promised. And in that he gives them a description, everything that they lacked in their wilderness journey would be there in abundance for them. So the, the hardships was a testing. When we are going through hardships, God is testing us so that we would recognize what is in our hearts. We need to remember that God is the source of all blessings. All of the blessings that we've had in the past have come from God. What we enjoy today has come from God. The blessings that we are looking forward to in the future come from God. It is all from Him. In this, it's important to see that God works in covenant relationship. He had made a covenant, a covenant with Abraham and with his descendants that he would do this for his descendants and bring them into this land. It was promised long time before these individuals were actually born. And so God always works in covenant. Now, a covenant is a formal agreement between parties 
to do or not to do something specifically. So God made a covenant with Abraham and with the Israelites saying, if you will keep my commands, these are the blessings that I am going to give you. If you don't keep my commands, then you will lose those blessings that I am giving you. When I think of us in the United States in the days in which we've lived, we, lived a, we live currently in the most blessed nation on the planet, but we are losing those blessings when we refuse to live in accordance with the word of God. When that independent spirit comes in and we think we don't need God, we don't need anybody, and, and we hear this all the time, that we're a great nation. We've always been a great nation. We've gone through hard times. We'll get through this as well. Without God, we are not going to make it. We need to turn back to God individually and as a nation, confessing our sins, asking God to forgive us and have mercy, and then making the decision to live under the Lordship of Jesus Christ to live with him as our savior. So as God made promises to Abraham and Israel that they would, uh, yes, go through hardship on that journey, but if they would trust and believe in God, he would bring them through to great blessings. When we go through hardships and we wonder why is this happening? God is allowing this to show us what is truly in our hearts. To show us that we need to understand and know how dependent we are upon God for our blessings. I think back in 9-11 after those planes hit those towers and they came down in such great heartache and sorrow and tragedy. And I remember seeing our political leaders get on the steps of the Capitol and they all sang, God bless America. And I remember thinking when we've turned our back on him and we've told him we don't want him in our schools and we don't want him in our government and we're trying to take it even off our currency, why would God bless us? Today, I want us to stop and think how much God loves us even in hard times. He is demonstrating how much he loves us because God disciplines those he loves as the son in whom he delights. So as we've celebrated communion today, as we've remembered what Jesus has done for us, he did it because he loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have life everlasting. Eternal life is offered to us. But when he offers it to us, there are covenant requirements that we would live under his lordship as our savior, choosing to do the will of the father, living a life of obedience to the word of God. And you may say, well, it's so hard to do that. Yes, it is if we try it under our own power. But God has given us the Holy Spirit with his power and his wisdom and his strength so that we could live the kind of life that God would have us to live. The grace of God has appeared to all of us and it teaches us how to say no to ungodliness and wickedness and how to live upright and godly lives in this present generation. God loves us so much. So when we think about all that we're going through, God is doing this so that we would see what's truly in our heart, whether we have a heart that is willing to submit to him and to the word of God and to live it with his help and power, or if we're going to continue to be independent minded and stubborn thinking that we're able to do this on our own. Friends today, surrender your life to Christ. Confess your sin. Believe him for your salvation, that through your faith in him and his shed blood on Calvary's cross, your sins are washed away. 
you were made righteous in his sight and that he has now received you as a son or a daughter, heirs of God, a co-heir with Jesus Christ. And you then too can keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, so that we know that as we can come to him and have our sins forgiven, made right in relationship with God, knowing that when we see him, we will not have to see him in fear, but in faith, and he will receive us for all eternity to be with him. Let's take a moment and pray. Father, thank you for what Jesus accomplished for us. And God, today we choose to put our faith in him, to receive him as Savior and Lord, and to live according to your word. Holy Spirit, help us to know your word and to live in a way that pleases God the Father. And we will rejoice in your presence for all eternity. Amen. God bless you. See you again next time.